guys, can you hear me? Let's see if we can't kick this thing off. <clears throat> Good morning. Well, afternoon, almost my time. So, <laughs> hope everybody had a nice week. Today, I'm going to try to keep it as short as I can. I have about an hour. Uh, as it stands, uh, my wife has a list of things that. Um, we need to get done, and I promised her we would try to get those done, so I want to try to keep this as down as um, short as possible. We may do another section a session on um, T-locks, uh, not about T-lock extension. See, th this lecture, this conversation is not necessarily about what comprises a T-lock, how I can use a T-lock for uh, different things. This is just an idea, a conversation about how to do T-lock extension because uh, that was a – very, very popular question that was asked uh, directly and indirectly, and it's also been asked by students um, in other classes. So I want to try to uh, get this ironed out as far as an illustration as to why we would do a T-lock extension. Now, bear in mind, a T-lock, a transport locator, is uh, going to be kind of like the NLRI, the network layer reachability information that we see in something like BGP. So there's a lot that goes into it. So maybe we'll have a, a, a specific class just on T-locks uh, and talk about public T-locks and private T-locks and things like that. I think that would also be a good exercise. Oh, hey, Jody. Oh. Jody's one of the guys uh, that are uh, helping me work out the bugs and uh, SD geeks. Hello, everyone. We'll kick off here in about seven minutes or so. I just figured I would uh, log in a little bit early and see if we can't get things worked out. Uh, Jody, were you able to uh, test the lab connection for me in SD Geeks? I didn't see a reply, so I didn't know if you've had time to get in today. Hi, Muddy. Give everybody a shout out for showing up. Greatly appreciate it. Hey, Thomas, there's another one of my repeater penders. Like I said, this one's going to be kind of short today. Uh, there's a lot of focus um, on. Hey, Pedro! Talk about a repeat offender. Pedro was actually one of my CCIE data center students. Uh, we were not going. To, we're not going to say how long ago, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, glad to see you in here, man. So, hmm. not enough coffee on the planet this morning to get me rolling. Okay, you were not. So, uh, Jody, when you get a chance this evening, please log in to uh, the, S the, the portal.sdgeeks uh, site. with that. I sent you information to log in um, um, in the chat in the uh, classroom. So uh, when you log in there, uh, I need to know you can successfully connect to the devices because we're actually going to start the SDA lectures. So I want you guys to be able to follow along. So when you log into that jump box that I gave you, um, you and the guys that are part of the, the, the SD Geeks group, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to browse over to that. Um, well, I'll just show you. You'll be able to browse over to the um, – um, sorry. You'll be able to browse over the DNA to the DNA Center, and then what we're doing is we're going to be instantiating devices in the environment. So one second here. I don't want to switch over to the timer, but I'll show you guys when the, when the time comes. So, uh, but again, what I need you to do is I need you to kind of test that for me, please. So, um, we'll spin up a, a border node and you, you'll be able to onboard that and then I'll get everybody connected to connections to the physical devices. All righty. Like I said, I hope everybody's having a nice weekend. I do apologize for the late start, late start today. Um, we had, we took our sons to a, a weekend camp 
And uh, I was of the impression that it was going to be about 40 minutes away like it normally is. And it's actually it was actually like six minutes away, and I'd already scheduled this to fire off today. But I know this is more conducive for you know any of the guys that are going to be, you know, overseas. I think it's what like noon my time is like nine thirty in India. I, well, I know India's got more than one time zone, but ish. So um, I'm hoping that's going to help out. And I'm, like I said, I'm going to try to keep for everybody that's just showing in. Uh, this is going to be a kind of a brief session. The conversation is going to be about T-lock extension, not necessarily about T-locks. But we can obviously, um, if you guys want to do another session, um, if anybody's willing to show up, I'm willing to talk about pretty much anything. Uh, but I'm trying to keep these down to one hour. Um, ideally, it would be one hour of being able to demonstrate what it is we're going to be doing. And then oh, actually less than an hour. It would ideally be like 30 minutes uh, and then 30 minutes of conversation and answering questions. Hi, Ollie. Lebanon. Wow. I don't think I've had anybody log in from Lebanon. I can check that off my list. Got a lot of old and friendly faces in here. Uh, well, like I said, Cisco's got a lot of changes going on in the grand schemes and the arrangements of everything right now, and uh, there's a lot of new stuff coming out. Also, I wanted to ask you guys, I was actually thinking about maybe next session. Would you guys be interested in talking about SIG tunnels, secure internet gateway tunnels? Uh, we could f uh, do a demonstration on how to set up a SIG tunnel to Umbrella. Uh, I think that might be a worthwhile exercise. So you got okay, cool. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> Jody's uh, checking something for me. So uh, I just recently uh, set up a a remote access environment for my, my students to be able to um, um, lab along during lectures because I also do live lectures inside of the SD Geek site. And uh, those are mostly focused on CCIE data center and CCIE um, enterprise infrastructure. So, uh, but obviously we do a lot of different things. Uh... Sorry, I keep horking my coffee, but pretty soon here I'm going to have to start typing and writing. Okay, so for the guys that are in SD Geeks, uh, next week I'm going to issue Catalyst devices so that you guys can go ahead and start doing some of the fundamental onboarding of devices and resources. Hello. All right. So here very shortly, we'll go ahead and get kicked off. Okay, cool. All right. So yeah, please, whenever you set it up, go ahead and reset your passwords. All right. Like I said, I want to try to keep this one simple. Uh, we uh, have a lot going on here. And what I want to do is I want us to talk a little bit about 
a situation that occurs in some environments. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to transition over to my desktop. And what we're going to see here is going to be an example of our lab. And our focus today is going to be on the idea of trying to leverage the capability of our environment. Now, what you'll notice here is, is that I have a router called INET, and I also have another router in our infrastructure that is called MPLS. So if I highlight these two resources, these devices are going to be what's providing all of the internal functionality in my network infrastructure. Now, every site that I have in this environment is what we refer to as dual, dual homed or dual attached. We can see that as an example in the environment where we have in the branch one, I have a single connection going out to both of our transport infrastructures. Now, as a direct result of that, what that does is that affords me a lot of functionality when it comes to being able to send information. However, what we will also note that is in branch one, when I start taking a look at what's going on in branch one, what we're going to see is I have one vEdge in this environment that is singly attached to one environment, and then I also have another that is going to be singly attached to the other transport. Now, as a direct result of this, I cannot instantiate physically a mechanism that is going to allow the device that is vEdge 15, the capability of being able to connect directly to the MPLS transport. In other words, it's not going to be dual homed. Now, when we talk about other applications, we talk about other protocols or other tools that we use in networking. Let's talk about OSPF as an example. We know that we have this construct called areas in OSPF. And we also need to understand that we have a special area called area zero. And area zero is going to be my backbone area. And we want to make certain that logically all information is going to, quote unquote, be exchanged by transiting that backbone. That's why we call it a backbone. And sometimes we run into a logical situation where we are not going to be physically attached to area zero. So what do we do? We create something called a virtual link. A virtual link, you could use other solutions, but I'm focusing on a virtual link right now because it compares close to what we're going to be talking about in the context of this discussion, is going to be a way of being able to hack around my problem. So let's talk about that from the perspective of our equipment. Because what we have here is we have a number of devices, specifically right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw an illustration that is going to be representative of this box right here. This is going to be VE16. And when we look at what's going on with VE16, we know that we have a physical interface and we know that that physical interface is going to be connected to my transport of MPLS. We also know that what we've done is we've taken this device and we've broken it up into different VPNs. Remember, we said before, a virtual private network in a Viptela vEdge device is the exact same thing as a VRF in a Cisco device. And we have special transports. We have VPN0, which is going to be the resource that we're going to use to connect to the outside world. And then we're also going to have a set-aside VPN of 512 for the purposes of management, which in a VEdge is going to leave me VLAN or VPNs 1 through 511 in order to be able to connect to what we call service-side resources. So if I have a resource that I'm going to be connecting to, let's go ahead and say it's a, a control plane border node in, say, for instance, an SDA infrastructure – what ends up happening is, is I'm going to place that in a VPN, say, for instance, VPN 100 or some other VPN. And then what we're going to do is we're actually going to rely on these transports to provide our connectivity to the outside world. But the issue that we're going to see here is, is that this device only has a single interface connected to a single transport. But the other device that is going to be in the same site with it is also going to have a single interface that's going to be connected to another transport. In this case, it's going to be connected to internet, which I'm calling gold.
Now, when we look at what's going on here, it would stand to reason that just like with a virtual link that we have in OSPF, where I can come up with a logical way of being able to hack around a physical problem, it would stand to reason that we should be able to do the exact same thing in SD-WAN, and we can. In this instance, what we're going to do is we're going to implement something called a T-lock extension. So ultimately, what I'm going to do is I want to take this T-lock right here, the one that is going out towards MPLS. I've been using orange for MPLS. And what I want to do is I want to come up with a way of being able to extend this connection logically so that I can leverage it on the device that's going to be adjacent to VE16. And this particular instance, we're talking about VEdge15. And what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to understand the process and the mechanism to allow this to happen. We have a single link. That single link is connecting gigabit Ethernet 02. So that's going to be the interface that I'm going to use. And if I were going to do this in a production environment, what I could choose to do is I could use sub-interfaces. I could use physical interfaces if I had sufficient interfaces to be able to do it. Or I could use sub-interfaces in concert with that switch that's going to be situated right here. Well, in this video, all I'm going to do is I'm going to extend MPLS so that it's going to be logically adjacent to VEdge15. Now, what I want to talk about first is I want to talk about what's happening in our current infrastructure because a lot of people get very confused when we start talking about T-locks and they get confused when we start talking about the IPsec tunnels that are going to be formed between T-locks. So for some students, it becomes kind of an issue that they get confused by. I'm going to go ahead and just create a new overlay here. I'll bring that one back. When it comes time, let's say that we are sitting right here on the edge 16. And let's say that I want to send data or communicate to resources that are going to be on the edge 13. Now, a lot of people get confused because when I tell them that this device is going to be connected to MPLS physically and has no physical connectivity directly to Internet, a lot of students really get confused because they don't really understand what that means. And what it actually means is that we're going to form tunnels, but we need to talk about how many tunnels we're actually going to be able to form. So as an example... It stands to reason to anyone that understands the transport capability that I should be able to send a tunnel from here to here. It may also come as a surprise that I may need to or could have the ability of being able to send a tunnel to here to here to here. In fact, what we're going to find is I'm going to get far more tunnels by default based on the fact that the INET in my lab and the MPLS in my lab are going to be physically connected and I'm running a routing protocol between them. Now, that's not going to happen in a production environment. So students ask me all the time, well, Terry, why do you do this? Well, I do this to ensure the fact that those devices that are only singly attached to MPLS will always have the ability to be able to communicate to my controllers in my lab environment. Why? Because I want students to be able to stand up the lab from the very, very beginning. But we got to understand that when we start talking about things like this, it really translates to this idea of obtaining reachability. So if I wanted to illustrate what I'm talking about, let's look at that. Because what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to make a major change here with a very, very minimal command. So let's go ahead and say I'm going to get into VEdge16. So all I'm doing is I'm opening a session to VEdge16, and from that section, what I'm going to do is I'm going to log into it. I'm going to go admin, admin, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say show run VPN0, and we're going to look at the interfaces that are going to be in VPN0. Right now, Gigabit Ethernet 00 is in VPN 0. That's that interface right here. Obviously, I don't want it there in the long run, but it's not harming anything. It doesn't have an IP address. It can't get an IP address. DHCP is not running on that segment. But if I scroll down and take a look at interface Gigabit Ethernet 01, we see that that is connected to the outside world. In other words, we can see here, plain as day, that it is going to be connected to the MPLS transport based on 
its color. And what we're also going to see is that I am probably going to end up needing to make a change. Because remember, I talked about the fact that we have these tunnels. Well, let's look at the tunnels. In SD-WAN, for every tunnel that I get, I'm going to get a corresponding instance of bidirectional forwarding detection. And that BFD session is going to be used later in our processes to determine loss, latency, delay, anything that's going to be associated with the connection between resources if I want to be able to make an intelligent routing decision. Application-aware routing is a thing in the SD-WAN, and it's a thing that we need to spend some time talking about. But before we talk about SD-WAN's AAR, we need to have a better understanding of T-LOCs and T-LOC extensions. And oddly enough, I'm starting at TLOC extensions because, like I said, that was what was the most request uh, coming from guys watching these live sessions. So when we look at what's going on, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say show BFD sessions, and this is going to show me all of the tunnels that I have that are going between devices. Now, you'll notice right here, we were talking about VEdge 13. So there's VEdge 13. Notice I, I can travel through... MPLS into gold, and I can travel through MPLS into MPLS. Those are those two tunnels that I was describing. Now, obviously, I've got dual connectivity to other devices and resources. Now, for the purposes of this walkthrough, what I want to do is I want to illustrate a way that we can curtail almost all of these options by saying that I only want to allow MPLS to form a tunneling relationship with MPLS. And that's a single command. If I say config T, VPN 0, interface Ethernet, or gigabit Ethernet 0, 1, that's, that's, it, that's interface right here, all I'm going to do is I'm going to say tunnel interface, and I'm going to specify the color of MPLS, but I'm going to use a keyword of restrict. Now, what that is saying, it's saying only allow tunnels to perform or to form between T locks that have the same color. That's all it is. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say commit and quit. And then I'm going to say show BFD sessions again. And what we're going to find is, is that it is now substantially smaller. In fact, you'll notice here to communicate to that device that I was calling out, which is VEdge 13, I now only have one single connection that must travel from MPLS to MPLS. Now, the reason that I did that was is to make certain that everybody is abundantly clear that VEdge 16 has no connectivity to anything but MPLS. And by saying that I can only form tunnels between T-locks on this interface that have the same color, I've pared this down to where we don't really have to worry about a whole bunch of ambiguous pieces of information as we go in and we start doing our modifications. Now, the whole objective here is going to be to follow a stepped process. First of all, we need to identify the interface and the T-lock associated with that interface that we want to extend. Now, earlier I was thinking about extending the MPLS down to VEdge 13. I've changed my mind. What I'm going to do is I'm going to extend internet through VEdge 15 to VEdge 16, and then in doing so, what I want to see is I want to see the instantiation of another tunnel. I want to see a, an ability to be able to come in here and say, show BFD sessions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it that I want it to see the BFD sessions that are going to be connected to 172.16.0.13. And right now, I only have the one that is going through MPLS because of that restrict command. Also, let me make it clear. If you want to use restrict, you should use that configuration everywhere where that transport exists. We don't want to run into any type of, or concept of asymmetrical forwarding or the attempt to form tunnels based on having configurations in a single location, and it is best practice to use it everywhere. But this isn't about best practice. This is about walking through the features and the capabilities of a technology. So what I want to do at this instance is I need to recognize how I'm going to have to do this. Well, to talk about that, let's bring back the overlay that I had, which was this one right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and minimize that connection. 
Because what's happening is in the scenario that I'm describing, I've changed my logic. So let me go ahead and say I'm going to get rid of this. I don't want to extend MPLS. What I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to take the connection on VEDGE 15. I'm going to take this interface right here that goes out to Internet. I'll just call it INET for short. And what I want to do is I'm going to use this physical interface that's going to be connecting these two resources so that I can extend it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my highlighter. I'll make that green. And ultimately what we want to do is we want to extend this resource such that it's going to be logically adjacent to VEDGE 16. And we're going to do that at the command line. I'm not going to use a template to accomplish this. I'm not trying to teach templates. And like I said in the last live session, I think that trying to learn templates and learn how things take place in SD-WAN from the very, very beginning can be slightly confusing. So I would rather everybody learn the core features and capabilities of a vEdge, how to impl implement things at the CLI, than I would want to teach templates and then have everything to where everybody's browsing back and forth through devices and resources in their home labs or, you know, in, in my labs. But the ultimate objective here is, is going to be the fact that we need to recognize that these two interfaces, this interface and this interface, have no association with each other. It's also important to note that this interface that's between these two devices does not have any type of IP schema associated with it. And we also mentioned the fact that we are going to be having that point where these interfaces, so in this instance it should be Gigabit Ethernet 00 in my lab, should be connected to INET, and we know that that is going to be in VPN0. So what I want to be able to do is that I want to start using this interface as a WAN interface, so guess where Gigabit Ethernet 02 is going to have to be placed? It's going to also have to be incorporated to where it's going to be a part of VPN0. And it needs to have IP addresses, and we need to make certain that we have reachability. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and instantiate a new slide here, an overlay, and we're going to make that happen. So the first step of this is to identify the interface and the color that you wish to extend. And then the second part is going to be to set up the physical connectivity. So what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to go into vEdge 15. And from vEdge 15's perspective, I'm going to say admin, admin. I'm going to go to config. I'm going to navigate to VPN 0 where I'm going to strategically place gigabit Ethernet 0 2. Gigabit Ethernet 02 is going to need an IP address. Let's go ahead and say I'm going to give it an IP address, and we will say 10.15.16.15/24. I'm going to no shut that interface. I'm going to say commit and quit. I'm going to go over to the edge 16, and what I'm going to do is on the exact same interface, config T VPN 0 interface. Gigabit Ethernet 2. I'm going to say IP address 10, 15, 16, 16 slash 24. No shut. I think I forgot that on the other one. And I'm going to say commit and quit and see if it applies. Now, from this perspective, let me see. Did I? Yeah, I did do a no shut. Let's see if I've got reachability. So can I ping from here? Can I ping 10? 15, 16, 16. Do I have reachability? I do. So we've satisfied the second step. The first step, identify the interface and the color that we're going to be extending. Two, we are going to then make certain that we have IP reachability and IP addresses that we can use in our instance. And step three is going to require me to extend that T-lock. Just like a virtual link would extend reachability through a non-zero area to a zero area or to my backbone, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Gigabit Ethernet 2 on VEDGE 15, and I'm going to tell the Viptela software, I want you to extend the link out towards Internet to me so that I can 
act as an interface that is part of this environment. A very, very simple process. To implement that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, go, again, go to 15. I'm going to say in VPN 0. I'm going to go to Interface Gigabit Ethernet 0 2. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to say TLOC extension, and I'm going to tell it what interface I want extended. I want to extend a Gigabit Ethernet 0 0 on this interface. And then I will say commit and quit. Now, in this specific scenario, what I've done, we'll just say, do a show run VPN 0, and we'll look at all of the config. So 0, 0, that is gold, so that's what I'm calling Internet. When I come down here and I take a look at Gigabit Ethernet 0, 2, what's going to end up happening is, is that I'm going to just simply extend Gigabit 0, 0. So what I'm doing is I'm taking Gigabit 0, 0, and what I'm doing is I'm now actually extending it out towards the edge 16. Now, the edge 16 is going to treat this interface no different than any other interface. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to do the configuration and pretend now that we are logically adjacent to the edge 15. The way we do that is, is no different than when we set up any other interface in the Edge 16. We go to config T, VPN 0, and in the context of VPN 0, all I'm going to do is I'm going to go to interface gigabit 0, 2. I am now going to go to tunnel interface. I'm going to say allow service all because I'm in a lab. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say color is going to be gold. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to say encapsulation IPsec and commit and quit. Now, what I've actually done in this particular scenario, didn't mean to log all the way out, admin, admin, we now need to take a look at the output of my config. So again, I fat fingered that, admin, admin. So now all I'm going to do is I'm going to say show run VPN0. And let's take a look at our config. So in this instance, we have color gold, but I got a problem. The problem right now is, is that I do not have a route out. So from the perspective of VEdge 16, VEdge 16 does not know where to send that data. Well, if I were to look at what I did on VEdge 16 as it relates to MPLS, what I did is I gave it a default route that points to the IP address of the MPLS router, which is this guy right here, 10.40.10.1. 10.40.10. This guy should be dot one. This guy should be dot two or dot 16, depending on how I did the, net and the, the it's dot two convention. So what I need to do now is I do need to apply a static route that's going to point out to the other connection. So I'll say VPN zero. I'm going to say IP route quad zero. We'll just put in a second quad zero route, and I'm going to say it's going to go out to 10.15.15 or 16.15. And I'll say commit and quit. Now we have a configuration here, and what we're going to see is VPN zero route static route next hop is the same interface gigabit ethernet 15, did I, oh, I'm on 15, sorry. Uh, I'm doing the config on the wrong device. So I'll say abort, and I need to go to 16. My apologies. So let me make sure that I didn't fat finger this thing out. So the TLOC extension, so it's on 16 that I did gold on two. So here's where I need to put that static default route. My, my apologies, config T, VPN zero. And I'm going to say IP route quad zero. Send it to 10.15.16.15. And I will say commit and quit. Now, <clears throat> let me clean the screen up here just a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to return back to my original drawing. So this is exactly what we did. I went to this device. And on this interface, I typed TLOC extension, and then I specified gigabit ethernet 00, zero as the interface that I wanted to extend. And the direct result of that was, is this device then takes that interface 
and that T lock color and extends it to where now it is logically adjacent to VH16. Can I give a configuration example? Uh, I no, I cannot right now. Um, I don't have a, a way of doing the the configuration uh, in the um, the C edges. In C edges, I typically will use a template for that. So can I also uh, can I'm sorry. Let me redo a little bit. So can you also extend INET to V? Yes, you would reciprocally. So the question from Jody is, is that in, let me go ahead and uh, navigate away from this. So the question was, is um, could I extend MPLS towards 15? And the answer to that question is, is not, not would I, the que answer to that question is, is yes, I would. And, but I, right now, all I'm doing is I'm just talking about the principle of extending an, a T-lock to do it both ways on a single interface, I would be forced to use sub-interfaces. I would have to have a second set of routes or a second network segment for the MPLS to go to Internet. You couldn't use the same links. But, again, all I would do is I'd take MPLS. I would do the extension on Gigabit Ethernet 2. And on uh, VEdge 15, I would just configure it as a regular VPN 0 interface. But that would be the ideal config. If you guys want to, because for the most part right now, in the Enterprise Infrastructure Lab, Cisco has opted not to do anything with the CSRs. I'm sorry, with the, well, CSRs, CAT 8Ks, and things along those lines in the context of the lab. I'm, I, I spun up a lab environment that doesn't have any C edges. If you guys want to start using or seeing C edges, I can fire up some C edges and we can start doing them. It's just not going to be in this session. Like I said, I, I'm on docket to take care of some things around the house today. So I'm trying to keep this one as short as possible. So, um, but if you want to see CSRs, I can take the devices in branch two and turn them to CSRs. No problem. It'll just be in the, in the next live. So um, I was really surprised because, you know, most of my clients don't use V-Edges. Most of my clients are, you know, ISRs, and they are trying to navigate the physical 8Ks, um, Catalyst 8Ks, uh, as a direct result of the fact that the, IR, the ISRs, although they work with SD-WAN, they weren't purpose-built to work with SD-WAN, where a Catalyst 8K is. So there's a lot of uh, benefit to shift. But when you start looking at it from this perspective, uh, I do apologize. Right now, I don't have any C-Edges in this environment. I have labs with C-Edges in them, but I'd have to shut this one down and, and bring those up. So, uh, and, and the other thing too is, is when I'm using C-Edges, I don't normally use an old version. This is 18.4.5. Uh, the CCIE lab, I think, is 18.4x. So I'm using, I use that for most of my demonstrations, uh, but I also have 20.9.1, which is the latest and greatest, which does multi-region and things along those lines. So um, I may transition. I I'm keeping these lives because there are a lot of people that need help preparing for the enterprise infrastructure exam, and everything that we're talking about is germane to the blueprint uh, that applies to that lab. So, but again, if, if people want to start seeing some of the newer, more modern stuff, you know, like SIG tunnels, which isn't tested in the lab or security integrations and things like that, to, to the best of my ability, I'm not a security person. But to the best of my ability, I can, I can try to get that instantiated for everyone. So the, the entire objective of this exercise was to make certain that when I send traffic from VEdge 16, let me get back into VEdge 16. What I want to be able to do is I want to be able to leverage the forwarding capability in the system for being able to use that interface. So if I say show IP route right now in vEdge 16, we can see that I do see two routes. When we start taking a look at what's going on in the environment, let's see if I have any tunnels. So show BFD sessions. Now, notice I've got multiple tunnels, but again, remember, we were focusing just on that connection to 13. So if I say to system IP 172.16.0.13, just for clarity's sake, what we're going to see is I still only have the one connection. Now, that begs the question, why? Well, the answer to that is, is the fact that we still have a routing situation. We still have to be able to forward prefixes. And the moment that I made a logical decision about adding Gigabit Ethernet 2 to VPN 0, 
I now have to worry about the outside world being able to get to that interface. And right now, I'm not running any routing protocol. So as an example, in a BGP environment, ordinarily what I would do is if I was running something like BGP with my service provider in an MPLS environment, what I would probably do is I would advertise that network on gigabit zero zero uh, gigabit zero two out towards MPLS so that there would be reverse reachability from resources. But if I, as it stands right now, what I'm trying to do is I am trying to send that traffic from VEDGE 16 out MPLS. I'm also trying to now send it out of gold or internet or INET, whatever we want to call it. And the problem is, is there's no way back. So as an example, if I were to go to INET right now from the, the perspective of that router, the question is, is it, can I get to that prefix? I didn't mean to exit. So can I ping 10.15.16.15? Shouldn't have any reachability to it. Why? Because I'm not advertising it. But this is a lab that I'm not talking about running a routing protocol out towards my service providers in VPN zero. So what we're going to have to do is kind of hack the process a little bit. So one of the ways that we could do that is I could come in here and I could create a static route. So bear in mind, traffic is coming from 16, traveling through internet. So I need to find a way to be able to backtrack to get information to that destination. So one of the things that I'm going to choose to do is I'm going to, let me close my laptop here. I'm going to go to 15 because I want to get that IP address that I'm using on gigabit 15. So I'm going to say show interface description, and I'm going to be using gigabit 00, which is this IP address right here. So all I'm going to do on this device is I'm going to say IP route, and I'm going to send any traffic that is going to be destined to 10.15 at 50 or 16. And I'm going to go ahead and put in 16, and we're going to match exactly. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to send that traffic to 10.40.10.2. So that's the IP address of this interface right here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say config T, router OSPF1, and I'm going to redistribute static with subnets. Now can I ping 10, 15, 16, 15? Let's see if it goes. Right now it's not going. And I'll try. I actually, I did it because I did 16, 16. I didn't do the whole network. So let's see. Can I hit 16? Sure can. So now when we take a look at what's going on, bear in mind, this would not be something that you would do in a production environment. There's no way that you're going to be able to say, well, I want my service provider to, you know, uh, put a static route in there. So, I mean, your only course of action at that particular juncture would be to obfuscate this through NAT, put a router in front of your VEDGE, which some people do, or have a routing protocol running with your service provider in such a way that you can originate this prefix, even if you're doing something like layer three VPNs using MPLS. So you've got a lot of different options in order to be able to do that. So let's take a look at this from the perspective of the resources now, and let's see what happened on 16, if anything. So I'm hoping that I'm going to end up having my routes. Now notice what's going on. I can send traffic from gold to gold. I can send traffic from gold to MPLS. I can send traffic from MPLS to MPLS. Now, why is this happening? Well, remember I said that ordinarily what we would end up doing is we would specify the instruction that says, hey, only allow the formation of tunnels to equivalent colors. So in other words, what's happening is on 15 or 16, I'm saying uh, do not allow the formation or uh, what I want to do is I want to restrict. Now, the problem that I have here is, is that I didn't do that for Internet. So what's happening is, is since the traffic is actually traveling from 16 through 15, I would need to make certain that my configurations were configured uniformly. Let's take a look at what would happen if I first take a look at what's going on in show run VPN zero. And when we take a look at what's going on in show run, show run VPN zero, notice I have gold. Now, what if 
just bear with me. What if? And again, I'm not. I'm I'm being unsafe. I'm not uniformly configuring everything. I'm using the command line so that we can walk through this process intelligibly as we go step by step. And remember, those steps were step one: find the device interface and the color that I need to extend. Step two: make certain that I have IP reachability on an interface. Place that interface in VPN zero and extend the T-lock on that interface. Point it towards where the T-lock currently exists. Step three is I need to have the ability to be able to get a static route or some way such that the device knows that it can load balance across those two connections and using two equivalent static routes with the same weight associated to them is going to work perfectly fine. So no problem there. Then the next issue is, is that once we get that instantiated, be absolutely certain that the network infrastructure that you're connecting to, a.k.a. the transit network infrastructure, has a way back, either through you know, lying, cheating, and stealing and building your own static route in a lab environment or advertising those routes out using some type of routing protocol that is running between your V-Edge or C-Edge and your service provider environment. So again, those are the key elements in order to be able to get this in place. But what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to take a, a step and I'm just going to cheat to see if I can get this down to two resources. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to say VPN zero interface gigabit Ethernet zero two. I'm going to go into my tunnel interface and I'm going to specify color gold and I'm going to use the restrict option. Again, I should just deploy that everywhere. Let's see if it bitches at me. We'll say commit and quit and Everything should be fine. So now if I repeat my show command for that specific destination, I should only have two available transits. So we get the capability of being able to manipulate the topological arrangement of IPsec tunnels in our environment with something as simple as the restrict command. There are other options that are available to us. We could use service graphs. We could implement what is referred to as a T-lock action. A T-lock action could be to change the behavior of these resources or the behavior of these devices through the utilization of policy. I could match specific traffic. Let's say that I have, say, for instance, VPN 10 and VPN 20, and I go in and create a policy that allows those two VPNs to communicate with each other the way I showed you in one of the the previous lives. But what if I don't want, I do want them to communicate with each other, but what if I want to make that traffic travel through, say for instance, a firewall? That's a service graph or a service chain if there's more than one resource. So what I could choose to do is I could say, okay, well, if I want to send traffic from TLOC 172.16.0.13 to 172.16.0.13, 16 or 15, what I could do is I could write a policy that says modify that T-lock and send it to, say, the headquarters office where I got a little Palo Alto firewall or a Cisco ASA or some type of firepower device sitting there that I could subject that traffic to firewall, deep packet inspection, or whatever resource or capability that I need to instantiate. And again, when, and I think the next session really needs to be about OMP, when you start looking at OMP, understand that OMP has three different types of prefixes. We have a VRoute prefix, which is going to resolve to a IP prefix, and the next hop is going to be a TLOC. That's why I say TLOCs are network layer reachability information for OMP, which behaves similar to, o, to BGP, but it's not the same. Think of them as bastard stepsons, stepchilds. So, I mean, they're, they're close enough, but still completely different. The second type of OMP route that we have is called a T-lock route. Because when I tell a router, oh, uh, Mr. Router, in order to be able to get traffic to VEDGE 13, you need to send that traffic to 172.16.0.13 plus the color used in PLS or internet. And the third option, which is going to be your encapsulation type, which by default will be IPsec. And I hand that to a routing protocol, it's going to go what do I do with this? Well, if it was BGP, we would take the next top and we'd look it up in an underlying IGP. But I don't run a routing protocol between V edges and C edges. What I do in OMP is I resolve the T-lock. If the T-lock is manipulated, I do that before I do the resolution using a policy. And then once I find that T-lock, I need to say, well, 
I need, to, I need a way of being able to reach that specific device. Because remember, the Edge 13 has one system IP, 172.16.0.13, but it's got two ways to go. So what I can do is I can advertise reachability through internet, 172.16.0.13 internet IPsec, or I could send the same thing and typically do both at the same time to reach my prefixes, send traffic to 172.16.0.13 MPLS IPsec. Two ways to go. So the question is, is what IP address do I send that to? Well, I resolve that as part of the OMP second route type, which is called a T-lock route. A T-lock route will resolve to a public or private regarding whether or not I'm using NAT in front of my V-Edge or C-Edge, and it's going to resolve that as an IP, and that can be forwarded. So OMP is kind of like BGP, but it brings with it a replacement for the lack of an IGP called T-lock routes. Well, the third type of route that we need to talk about probably in a future session is going to be what we refer to as a service route. That's the third type of OMP route that you can work with. And that is going to be a tag that's going to designate the type of service that a particular piece of traffic is going to be sub subjected to. Is it an IPS? Is it an IDS? Is it a load balancer? Is it a firewall? Gives me the capability of being able to pre-mark that uniformly across my infrastructure in such a way to allow communications to take place based on the way I or you want to run things through the utilization of policies, whether they're application-aware policies, whether they're going to be data policies, whether they're going to be control plane policies, centralized or localized in each of those individual flavors, again, depending on what it is you're going to be doing. So the whole object of the exercise today was to just show how simple something like a T-lock extension is. But a T-lock extension is only simple if you understand the way the communication takes place. So you need to have a firm theoretical understanding of what happens in OMP, Overlay Management Protocol, in order to be able to, one, get a visualization of what is going to happen by default, and then at that particular moment, when you understand what's going to happen by default, the next job is to understand how you can manipulate that. You know, that's where the Jedi mind tricks happen. This is going to be, this is not the path you're looking for. And you want the data to go the way you want the data to go. And it's not until you have a firm understanding of the theoretical components, the things that everybody blushes over, that you can really understand how, why, and where you can instantiate and implement policy. And we're going to talk about that in some future sessions. I shot for 30 minutes and I overshot where I'm sitting at firmly at about 42 minutes. I haven't even really looked over at the chat. I know I've been going on quite a bit, but I want to go ahead and ask you guys if you have any specific questions. And also, as always, if you want to see a specific topic, if you want to see layer three T-locks, that's going to be a session in its own self. If you want to understand how T-locks work in concert with OMP, let me know in the chat. If I don't know what you guys are interested in, I'm sitting up here coming up with different ideas in order to be able to do these lives. So I want to hear from you guys. I also want you guys to understand that these videos are designed to help people along the way. I mean, if you want to go along the, across the entire path, I'm building a, a school, which is the best way to, to say it, called SD Geeks. I've got a number of guys in the audience that are actually part of that program. We're expanding lab functionality. We're expanding live lectures. We just recently had a lecture. Um, it was what, Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday night. No, Thursday. Thursday, we had a live lecture on automation where we went through and we basically are executing commands on Catalyst devices by sending Python sequences directly to the API and DNAC. We're going to have another session on that. Ultimately, I want to get this to where it's almost like a university where, you know, we're going to be teaching classes on a regular basis. They're going to be scheduled. And if you can't attend, you can watch in the video. And as of this morning, if all continues to go well, you'll be able to lab on your own. So, uh, again, the whole object and the exercise of all of this is to get information out to try to help people where necessary. Because I remember when I was studying for my CCIE, I felt like I was in a vacuum. And it was extremely difficult uh, to get past that. And the way for me to get past that was 
I met Narbit Kacharians, and and he basically reached reached out and helped me at every turn. And if I can return that favor, that's what I'm trying to do. That's what this is about. That's what SD Geeks is about. SD-geeks.com is, is the site. If you want to, just go take a look at it. If you have any questions or anything about it, I mean, don't, don't just sign up uh, for something. I mean, understand what it is you're going to be signing up for if you want to take part in, a, in say, for instance, a more guided uh, set of exercises. You know, send me an email. Uh, you can send me an email, email at um, uh, geekprime at sd dash um, Geeks.com. Sorry, I drew a blank there. Uh, I'll get all of that information and, and put it in place. But um, what I'm trying to do with SD Geeks is to teach everything that everybody needs to know before they take, say, for instance, my CCIE data center boot camp or they take my uh, enterprise infrastructure software to find infrastructure classes that I teach for Narbic. I mean, these aren't replacements. These are supposed to be differential and they're supposed to be complementary uh, training because the problem that I had for the longest time was is I would tell students, like, well, how do I learn SD-WAN? I'm like, well, you know, here, l let, me, let me break it down for everybody here, all right? There, all the data, everything that you need to know to become a CCIE is on the internet. You don't need me. You don't need Narbic. You don't need the half a dozen companies that are out there. But that means that the, the, the job of finding the data, making sure that the data and information is right, finding an information is going to be presented in a way that resonates with you, that's all on you. The only thing that I try to do with students that want to become CCIEs is I try to, I try to cultivate the information, I try to curate the information, and I try to distill everything down. I mean, as an example... I've been teaching for almost, well, I've been a CCIE. I just got my 10-year plaque behind me. So I've been a CCIE for 10 years, and I started teaching the week after I became a CCIE. And I record every class. I literally have, I think there's something like five terabytes of storage of lectures that go back all the way to when I first started lecturing on BGP, on all kinds of different topics. But the problem that I run into with this is, is that my first thought was, well, I'll just take all that, I'll put it together, and I'll charge somebody some money, and they'll watch those videos, and everything will be fine. Well, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I have a CBT Nuggets account. I have a Pluralsight account. I have um, a Udemy account. And, I mean, if, if, we were to, if I were to think about, you know, a bushel basket, and that bushel basket had apples in it, and every one of those apples corresponded to a, a class that I've paid for or I took, there'd be a bite missing out of every damn one of those apples, but not one of them would have been consumed. And the other thing is, is that when you're studying for something, you know, I can come up here and say, yeah, I've got, I've got 900 plus hours of lecture. Who's got the freaking time to go through 900 hours of lecture? That lecture needs to be boiled down, distilled down, cogent and relevant to whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm looking for people that are willing to be a part of that, and that's what SD Geeks is. If, you're, if you don't want to do the heavy lifting, if you don't want to do the labbing, if you don't want to eke out and try to figure things out on your own, or if you want to be spoon-fed, I'm not your person. I'm not, I'm not the, the, the person that you want to go to. And, I mean, to be perfectly honest, in 10 years, I've dropped the ball all over the, all over the place. I've tripped. I've fell. I, I've looked bad. I've done everything. But I'm still trying, and I'm still trying to figure things out. I'm try, still trying to, to help people. I have students that are taking the lab exam in two weeks, and they get access to pretty much everything that I have. I have guys who I celebrated with last week, and I also had guys who I helped wipe away the tears because they didn't pass, and they're getting ready to go back again in another two months or, no, a month. So from the perspective of what I'm trying to do, that's it. I mean, I'm not making promises. Uh, we are putting material out. We are having live sessions similar to this, only a lot more technical, and I'm adding the labbing component. Like I said uh, at the beginning of this, a lot of guys are actually logging in and checking things. So, um, and a lot of that content is geared towards the lab level type stuff where I'm using the same versions and the same operating systems. But to be perfectly candid, I'm getting tired of that because... The problem is, is that if you take a CCIE and you get a CCIE, the job, the thought is, is you're going to be able to turn around and take that CCIE and work in an environment. Well, the problem is, is if you're being tested on a piece of software that is, 
you know, maybe four years old, but it's gone through 15 evolutions between when you learned it and what's being sold in the production environment. You're missing the to you're missing what you need. When I was when I became a routing and switching CCIE, I was making money day one. I mean, I I, I went my I think my salary increased by like sixty thousand dollars after becoming a, a routing and switching CCIE, and then I became a CCIE in data center. In all honesty, honestly, to prove that I didn't just stumble into I wanted to see if I if it was a fluke or not. So, I, I mean, I took the CCA data center and did, I, I thought I did very well. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'm proud of the fact that I failed the route switch. I failed it twice, passed it my third time. Data center, I failed it twice, passed it my third time. All right? You know, learning from somebody who does it first time doesn't mean that you're going to succeed first time. But it sure as hell makes it easier for me to say, yeah, I've been through it. I understand where you're coming from. This is how I dealt with, with the failure, and this is how I managed to move on. And, oh, by the way, you know, I, I was able to pull it off. And if I can do it, anybody can. So, the, but the point of what I was trying to say distills down to pretty much just one fact. And that is, is that when I became a data center CCIE, I'm like patting myself on the back. I, I graduated, I got, got my certificate, everything was good to go. You know what my first paying gig was? Enter vSAN routing. I didn't even have any idea what it was. It wasn't on the blueprint. And apparently, you know, at the time I was surprised to find that it was a pretty big deal. Enter vSAN routing is the ability to be able to communicate to storage resources that are separated in separate vSANs. And you do that using something very similar to – that looks almost like routing on a stick, but it's for a storage environment. So – but the, but my point was is that I had a brand new minted CCIE, and a buddy of mine is driving me to Houston, Texas, and I'm sitting in the passenger seat with the IBM Red Book trying to figure out what the hell IVR is so that I can speak intelligently to it at a, jo at a job interview as a consultant. Got the job, pulled it off, worked great. But what I'm getting at is, is that just because you got a CCIE doesn't mean you're going to be able to turn around and immediately start working in an environment doesn't mean that you're immediately going to turn around. You're going to know everything there is to know about SD-WAN or SDA. If, if we log into an SDA DNAC not right now running 133 whatever, 1317, 1339, which is what I ended up having to upgrade to to make it stable, and then, you know, you go into a job site and, and, and Cisco's getting ready to release 134, I think, 1341. Well, you know, right now, most of my client base is looking at 1334. Guys, it don't even look the same. Crap's not even in the same place. Yeah, you may know what to do, but you won't know where in hell to go to do it. So all I'm trying to do is make certain that you learn what you need to know to pass, but at the same time, you also not learn what you need to know to not look like an idiot when you show up at a job site or a work site. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to sw uh, to uh, swip out the uh, the soapbox, but um, it's it's definitely... It's frustrating. It's very, 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 very frustrating when you have guys that have, you know, sat the exam and they've, and they've literally gotten beaten up and they finally get their CCIE and, you know, they think they're over the over the hump. And then when they get in the job market, they make the realization that they've still that there's still a huge amount to learn. It, 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 it's demoralizing. It, it really, really is. And you add to that the fact that, you know, there's no such thing as a homogenous infrastructure anymore. I mean, I go from client to client to client. Yes, all of those clients may have, you know, I, I do more data center than anything else, or at least I used to. They all may have a UCS, a unified computing system. But that UCS uh, that might be running Nutanix. It might be running VMware. God help you if you're running, you know, if it's Hyper-V. But my, my point out of all of this is going to be the fact that there is no silver bullet today. And the reason that there's no silver bullet today is because there are so many choices and so many options. You know, sometimes I ask myself, if I had to do it all over again, would I have gone directly into to cloud native infrastructure? You know, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, Microsoft Azure, because I do a lot of that. But, at the, but honestly, when I get called, with organizations that are having those problems, I'm getting called because I'm a CCIE, not because I have an AWS certification. 
Nine times out of ten, I get a call because the guy who learned the pointy clicky crap has a problem because when the pointy cl clicky crap don't do what the pointy clicky crap is supposed to do, he don't know what to do. He don't know what action to take. He didn't see the technology evolve. That's what we've got to translate. That's what we've got to present in front of people. It can't be about taking and passing an exam. It can't be about dumps. It's got to be about learning the technology and becoming subject matter experts and recognizing the fact that there's no possible way that you can become a subject matter expert in everything. Pick a lane. Find something that you enjoy doing. Find something that you do well. Defend it like hell. Find a lane and dominate it. If that's the case, then it's a popular solution. You're going to be fine. I mean, for the first 10 years of being a CCIE, I made more money with UCS than anything. Unified Computing System. I, I didn't enjoy it that much, but I did learn to love it. And then ACI came down the pike, and I, I would have told you that if, if, if you had come to me five years ago or six years ago, four years ago, and said, uh, Terry, you really need to learn ACI because all of your clients are, are sh shifting over to software-defined networking functionality using either SDA or using ACI, I would have told you you were smoking crack. I never saw the possibility, but Cisco kept selling 9Ks, selling 9Ks. They stopped selling 7Ks pretty much. I mean, you could buy them, but they weren't pushing them. And then one day, there's this critical mass of equipment where, you know, somebody walks up and says, you know, you could buy an APIC, and then all of a sudden, you can just run everything using this. I would have never, ever, 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 ever thought in my area, which is a relatively rural area. I'm, I'm close to Virginia. I'm in Virginia. I'm close to Richmond, Virginia. I would have never, ever thought that anybody would, would use ACI. Well, guess what? Last year, I paid my mortgage during COVID working on application-centric infrastructure and SDA. More ACI than SDA initially, but I will say now, I mean, it's near the end of this year, I'm doing more SDA, SD-WAN than I ever did UCS, than I ever did ACI. And one of the reasons being is, is that there are no, and, I'm, and again, I'm not blowing a horn, I'm not saying anything, but there are no people that are taking the time to become subject matter experts. I mean, I'm, I'm 15 feet away from an entire data center of equipment, UCS, uh, 32 catalyst devices. Uh, I mean, I have everything that I need. I get to play with this stuff all day long. And every time I, I, every time I think I understand exactly how something works, I make a realization that really and truly, I don't know enough to know what I don't know. So I'm, like, I'm no different than any of you guys, which is why I'm here, which is why I'm not in the house, you know, snuggled up on the couch with my wife because the kids are gone. I'm here because I have a vested interest in returning the favor. You guys may be familiar with something called Paredes Principle. Uh, the Paredes Principle says that 80% of your benefits or 80% of your results are going to relate to 20% of whatever you're putting in. So, you know, 80% of your profits is related to 20% of your, um, your clients. Uh, in my time, you know, 80% of what I've been able to pull off as far as what I can do for a living and what I can teach is related to 20% of my effort. I mean, and I, ha I studied for the routing and switching exam for almost five years. Getting pissed off and taking off some time, making the realization that, you know, I, I'm a father and I still got to do other things. I mean, you know, that's what all of us face. But 20% of my effort translated to what, I, what I'm doing. That was five years. And when I met Narbic, it was like everything kind of like fell into place. And I had a mentor. I had help. I had everything. And again, I wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for him. And I'm hoping five years from now, somebody's going to be able to say, I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for you. And if we can instantiate that pay it forward mentality, we can claim this community back. We can claim this idea of, you know, being, you know, whether we're software defined or whether we're legacy slash traditional networking infrastructure, we're all still doing the same thing. We're all forwarding packets. We're all making certain that those packets arrive to their destination and we have a way of being able to protect those packets in transit. That's what it's all about. But it really and truly, it's all about us. It's all about the exchange of ideas. It's all about the promise of being accountable to each other and not being in a vacuum. So, 
you know, that's what that's the reason I'm doing what I'm doing. And I and again, I didn't mean to uh, to whip the uh, soapbox out, but um, you know, that's where I'm at. I'm in a I'm personally I feel like I am in the exact place at the exact time doing the exact thing that I was meant to be able to do. And I wouldn't be able to do that if it wasn't for people who were handing off knowledge. I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to do that if it wasn't for the kindness of, you know, Narbic and Janet and 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 their entire family. They're like an extension of my own family. And it wouldn't be the same without guys like you. I mean, I've got I've got students in here, uh, Pedro and and other people that that I've known for years that I met in a classroom. It doesn't end at the classroom. Narbic used to always say our relationship doesn't end on Friday. It began on Monday. Well, it's the same thing I'm telling to everybody else. There's no way that I can do all the heavy lifting for anybody. But if somebody's doing the heavy lifting and they need a boost, I'll do my damnedest to be there to help. And that's what this is all about. So with that, I'm going to stop jammering. Sorry. Didn't mean to turn that into a, a rant. But... Um, None of this is that difficult, really and truly. I mean, Anthony Sequeira said it best. The most complicated task is made up of some, a combination of some of the simplest steps and procedures under the sun. So, you know, read, read Tim Ferriss's books. Learn about how to deconstruct. Learn about how to sequence and things along those lines. And those, th that information will be just as useful to you as understanding all of the nuances behind things like BGP and OMP. Because really and truly what you're doing is you're investing in yourself. Everything that you do, every hour away from your family, every lab you do, everything is, is a direct investment in you. And if you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to be able to leverage it for what it is. All right. Sorry. Any questions? I'll let you guys go. Like I said, I promised I would be out of here by 1 o'clock. Uh, can I give the, uh, Ola, I will, rec I will actually set up a C, a C edge and I'll either record how to do a T lock extension or we'll do it in a live session. Um, I don't know if anybody's still here. I started a pretty long tirade. So, um, just to understand, I, there was, a, there was a lot of stuff that was going on in the chat before the, before things fired off. Um, about worth and about value and about dumps and things along those lines. So I just wanted to uh, kind of address that. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and pull the plug here. I will see everybody next week. Uh, if you want to have any say and to, as to what is going to show up in lectures, uh, again, you have to give me the comments. Comment in this section. If you're watching this as a recording, uh, rather than being live, uh, again, I try to listen to everybody. I'll make a decision about Tuesday or Wednesday. Next week, I am teaching an ACI course uh, for uh, Micronics, so I'll, I'll be mostly working in the evenings. But I will see everybody here, hopefully. All right, so you guys have the, uh, uh, an excellent remainder of your weekend. So, SD-WAN, do you get the lab access? Yes. I'm working on the details right now. We just rolled out lab access uh, last night, and they're testing it for me this morning. So the intent is, is as an example, uh, in, in SD Geeks, if, I, if I'm lecturing, the object is, is to give everybody time to do what I'm doing. So guided labs in there. Okay. So whether you, if you walk away from any with anything from today, from this lecture, I don't really care if it's about extending um, T-locks because – Compared to believing in yourself and realizing that you can and you have the power and the capability of being able to do something, whatever it is you want to be able to do, that pales the technology component because that's the most important thing and having somebody that backs you through that process. All right. So I'm going to do a video series. I'm going to do probably two or three videos uh, introducing SD Geeks, talking about what it is, and uh, maybe I'll do a, a dedicated live to it. I, just, I don't like those sleazy webinar things where you're, you get them in there and you talk about how great it is and you ask them for money. I, that, that's not for me. I'm not a salesperson. Can I share the SD Geeks email once again? Oh, sure. It's geekprime at sd-geeks.com. Here, I'll put it in the chat.
I had my name in there, but nobody spells it right. So <laughs> it everybody uses everybody uses Vincent instead of Vinson. So, but yeah, Geek Prime. So I changed it. No questions. I battered everybody about the heads and shoulders too long, I guess. All right. So let's go ahead and pull the plug. I will see everybody next Saturday. Again, if you want to hear anything about a specific topic, don't hesitate to let me know, but do so in the comments. I will check those Monday and Tuesday evening, and then I'll make a decision as to what we're going to be doing probably Wednesday. All right. Hey, and Kit. <laughs> I'll see you in class, man. For those of you that haven't logged off, I mean, you know, you were asking about lab access. Give me just one second here and I'll switch over. Um, let me... Let me disconnect from this. Sorry, power, Terry. Power. It's a Windows machine. I don't know how to use it. So, fundamentally... What we do is I have portal students log into portal.sdgeeks. This isn't the website. This is just the ability to be able to log in. There's Jody. So I'll log in as me. And it will. I'm getting ready to put two factor authentication in. And if I got my sums right, what, what it'll do is it'll take me to my lab console. So as an example, uh, once I'm in the lab, what I do, what I can do is I can I can connect to um, the as an example the DNA C that I, that I use. In fact, the, the mini DNA C that I have is accessible in the. Uh, uh, this lab right now is what we're testing with. So I'm, I'm, I'm connected on another computer is what's happening here. So, whoops, sorry. See, this is what we're testing. Uh, right now, the problem is I've, I've logged into more sessions than I'm allowed. So, but uh, let's see, can I get Visual Studio Code to fire up? So, yep. So, um, the the goal or the plan is to have everybody or give everybody access to their own environment. So, as an example, if, I, if I'm lecturing uh, in the Geek site, we did um, – uh, this was uh, the last session that we had in, in Geeks, which was going to end up being um, about um, – Python. I'm killing my bandwidth is what I'm doing. So we here's what I'm looking for. Uh, this is what we did in, in in session and students now now students can actually log uh, actually log in and do the lab whether they're watching it in a recording or whether they're um, not uh, whether they're alive. Sessions is everybody will have access to their own devices and resources and be able to lab that way. All right. So, and again, I'm still working some of the, the, the deployment issues uh, out of the, the core environment, but right now my computer is like bogging down. I'm trying to change over to where I can even talk to you guys and it's not moving. There we go. Yeah, it's my PC. I'm doing too much with it. I'm streaming and I'm trying to lab and do a bunch of other stuff. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop here. I will see everybody hopefully next Saturday. I hope this was worth your time. And uh, again, I apologize for preaching, but that's kind of what I feel like I am sometime. I feel like I'm an evangelist. Students tell me all the time uh, we're not saving lives, but technology can change lives. Change the mind. All right. I'll see everybody next Saturday. Uh, and again, I appreciate everybody showing up that did show up. Talk to you later.